and you sit. Hello. Hi. 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 Uh, very good. So, um, welcome everyone. We, we we're still letting people in. We we will start formally in in a couple of minutes. Fine. Fine. Mm -hmm. Full screen. No. 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 We want. You don't want that. You want these people, don't you? You want to get rid of that. Okay, should we should we start? Um, Shreya, should we go full full screen again, maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so welcome to this ag agrarian change webinar, which is the first of this season uh, webinars. Uh, it's a roundtable on capitalism crisis and COVID nineteen, with a focus on agrarian political economy and circus of capital and labor. Let me start by welcoming the roundtable speakers. Ruth Hall from Plas University of Western Cape. Ruth, Valeria Hernandez, Universidad Nacional de San Martin from Argentina. Orlando Ruthven, uh, who's a Delhi-based independent scholar and practitioner. And Jonathan Paddington from the University of East Anglia. I'm Jens Lerge from uh, SOAS, University of London, and from the Journal of Agrarian Change, and I'll be chairing this session. I'm also joined by two co-organizers, Rea Sena from University of Cambridge, uh, and uh, Henry Castagnon here from SOAS. <clears throat> the seminar series is organized by the Journal of Agrarian Change and the Department of Development Studies at SOAS. You can find the full program uh, on our website, Agrarian Questions. Before we start, let me highlight uh, a few participation guidelines. Please keep your microphone off, except when taking part in discussion. And you can write questions and comments in the chat at any point in time. That's also the case for those of you that have joined us through our YouTube live stream. There's a chat function there too. In addition to that, in the question and answer session that follows the presentation, those in the webinar can also ask live questions. Simply use the raised hand function or raise your hand <laughs> physically. We will try to notice that as well. Uh, and of course, when asking a question or making a comment, please be considerate and respectful. Finally, we're going to record the session. If you do not wish to be recorded, simply don't use your audio and, and your video. Okay, it's now time to get on uh, with the roundtable on capitalism, crisis, and COVID-19, agrarian political economy, and circuits of capital and labor. The importance of this topic is self-explanatory, I think. The Journal of Agrarian Change also published a symposium on this a few months ago, and several of today's speakers contributed to that symposium. For the roundtable, each of our speakers will first give a brief presentation, and after that, we will have a question and answer session and wider debate. I will introduce the speakers as we move along. So our first presenter is Jonathan Patton. He is an associate prof professor at the University of East Anglia and an editor of the Journal of Agrarian Change. He has published extensively on agrarian and labor relations in India. But the reason why he's here today is that he is also the main author of the introductory overview article in the recent Journal of Grand Change Symposium on COVID. So we asked Jonathan to, to provide a short introductory overview to get us going. Um, 
After that, we would have the presentation by Ruth Hall, and then uh, Valeria Hernandez, and then Orlando Ruth Wayne. But now, over to you, John, um, to kick off the, 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 the round table, and you got 12 minutes to be very precise. Thanks, Jens. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming along, and thanks to Jens, Shrey, and Enrique for their usual slick organizing. Um, and as one of the editors of the Journal of Growing Change, I'm very happy that we have Orlando Roof and Valeria here from different parts of the, of the Global South today. Um, a note first on how I will present. I have a, a habit of moving around quite a lot when I'm speaking spontaneously and movement and Zoom don't go very well together. And there's a risk of making you feel a little bit dizzy. Uh, so in order to be somewhat stiller, I'm gonna mostly be uh, reading from a prepared script. Uh, so back in June, the Journal of Agrarian Change uh, published a symposium on COVID-19 entitled Capitalism Crisis and COVID-19, Agrarian Political Economy and Circuits of Capital and Labor. This introduction to the round table will outline some of the trends from the symposium papers and the broader literature. And then it'll finish off with two relating uh, to global food systems and rural politics. But first, I just wanted to run through the questions that we asked authors to address. How has COVID-19 affected agrarian social formations and the social classes and groups within them? How much has accumulation been constrained, where and for how long? Which commodity circuits have been disrupted and to what degree? Will capital continue to extract ecological surpluses in the same ways and to the same extent? To what extent and in what ways has reproductive labor been intensified? To what extent and why have the conditions of classes of labor deteriorated? And what have the changes meant for struggles between different classes of capital and between capital and different classes of labor. The author's responses in late 2020 were of course preliminary, but they underlined the unevenness of the impacts across regions. 80% of those who fell into extreme poverty in 2020 were in South Asia and Africa. And also unevenness across commodities, social classes, ethnic groups, and between men and women. COVID-19 has highlighted that the deprivations of contemporary capitalism are experienced most crudely by women, ideologically and politically constructed racial minorities, and hundreds of millions of informal precarious workers. It has also highlighted the nature of what we might call the neoliberal food regime, with its just-in-time global commodity chains that accelerate climate change, promote soil exhausting monocultures, and contribute to generating increasingly unequal access to land. Unlike most small farmers, agribusinesses Valeria and Carla Grass's paper points out, have seen strengthen during COVID. So in broad terms, four key trends emerge from the symposium in the broader literature. The first trend, the impacts of COVID-19 have been gendered and racialized. The crisis has revealed the degree to which the capitalist world food system depends on overt, often overtly racist and casteist regimes of migrant exploitation and on the gendered and racialized nature of care work and reproductive labor. Evidence from the ILO and others indicates that women have borne a greater share of the economic consequences in terms of wage reductions, in terms of violence, and in terms of reproductive labor burdens. The second trend, classes of labor, most of whom depend on informal wage labor and petty forms of self-employment, including farming, have been worse hit. For example, Bada and Tabe and Sano's symposium article showed the negative impacts on Ghanaian women who combine small family farming and long distance trade. The ILO estimated the global labor income dropped by 8.3% in 2020. The lowest paid and women have been hit the hardest and many of those affected are rural based workers, most obviously perhaps migrant workers, but there has also been a loss of agricultural work as smaller farmers have uh, increasingly been using family labor. Most street vendors have also seen incomes drop, wages have declined globally. 
capitalism's growing crisis of simple reproduction has been intensified. The third trend, there have been broadly negative, but very uneven impacts on small farmers, depending on the commodities they produce and when lockdowns hit in the agricultural cycle. The impacts, as Zhang and Hu state in their symposium article, relate to positions in the circuits of capital, labor, and commodities. For example, pig farming in Zhang and Hu's fieldwork area was less affected than more time-sensitive poultry farming. Farmers integrated into longer commodity chains, like Kenyan farmers producing vegetables for European markets, were relatively severely affected. McBurney et al. symposium paper on Ecuador indicated that Highland Kichwa farmers producing potatoes and onions for local markets did okay, while grain traders selling into longer commodity chains were squeezed by merchants. The fourth of the four trends that I wanted to highlight, the consequences for capital, and these have varied across sector and time. While some individual capitalist enterprises have disappeared, big pharma, big tech, finance and agribusiness either never suffered a contraction or expanded their reproduction after a brief hiatus. COVID-19 has generated crises within capitalism, but not of capitalism. Capitalism reproduces itself in crisis. And what we have witnessed is a temporary, somewhat distorted intensification of its competitive dynamics. So overall, the trends are of unevenness and increased inequality. The world's richest thousand people increased their, their wealth by $3.95 billion during 2020. So these are the key trends that emerged from the symposium. But has COVID-19 raised new questions about dynamics of agrarian change or cast old questions in a new light? So as well as summarizing the trends that came out of the symposium, I wanted to open things out a little bit and raise a couple of questions or issues. Firstly, with more land controlled by large agribusiness, greater share of the value produced in agriculture flowing to agribusiness, and more and more soil being exhausted by the short-term profit motives of agribusiness-led monocultures, has the time come for reasons of equity and ecology for a more concerted push towards the agroecological food sovereignty agenda? But how big a dent would it make in the global social reproduction crisis and which farmers would participate? Such an approach requires systematic engagement with the dynamics of class relations in the countryside. Even slight variations in land holdings can generate substantial differences in the distribution of power and wealth. And that has implications for any strategy for change. And would the channels of food distribution need state support, state, regula state regulation, state control? And if so, how would capitalist states with close links to big capital be made to take up such a role? The final set of issues that I wish to raise, uh, this relates to rural politics. So as well as intensifying the crisis of, of reproduction, the highlighting of mass movements of people between cities and the countryside has further underlined the poorest division between urban and rural. This has implications for rural politics and how a progressive politics should be imagined and practiced. Should counter moves against capitalism's gendered and racialized oppressions and the often authoritarian states that enforce them center on localizing economies and food systems with small farmers as the primary agents of progressive change? Or should it focus on the overlapping but much broader category of class of labor, not just small farmers, but also informal laborers, women, migrants, and ethnic minorities all across rural urban divides and whose struggles encompass the productive and reproductive spheres, struggles for protection from climate change, and for healthcare and housing, especially in those places where the capacity of states to support social reproduction has been undermined by neo-colonial structural adjustment and the continued appropriation of wealth and resources from the global south. An internationalization of resistance by classes of labor is of course impossible for many, often super exploited and indebted and made to work across multiple underpaid forms of wage labor and petty commodity production. And easier for those who are most tightly integrated 
often easier for those who are most highly integrated into the global commodity chains that exploit them, but also accord them more structural power. Orlanda, in her paper in the symposium, talks of workers disentangling themselves from a failed formality. Rather than looking to a diminished politics of traditional workplace sector-based unions, generally premised on compromises with capital and gains for some workers, but not others, might a multiplication of more autonomous forms of collective action have a greater chance of subverting the existing balance of class forces. Struggles of labor linked to struggles against climate change and against racism and patriarchy, struggles in other words against the violences of capitalism. Is it too absurdly optimistic to stop seeing fragmentation of social reproduction primarily as a problem? and start seeing it as a multiplication of potential points of collective action and an intensification of the social collisions that can foster collective consciousness amongst circulating small farmers, wage laborers, women, migrants, and politically and ideologically constructed racial minorities. And I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jonathan, um, for lots of food for thoughts, lots of issues raised. Um, few answers given, though, some attempts towards the end, though, to, to some hope at least. Uh, hopefully these are issues we can return to uh, as we go along and in, in the question and, and answer session. Um, but for now, it, it's time to, to, to get on with the, with, with, with the three um, um, main presentations of the, of the, of the, of the uh, round table. And I will now uh, invite Ruth Hall to, to give the next presentation. Professor Ruth Hall holds the South African Research Chair in Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies at the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies at the University of Western Cape. Um, Ruth has published extensively on land reform, tenure and governance in Africa with a focus on transnational land investment investments. She also serves on numerous international advisory boards and scientific committees, and also find time to convene courses for activists and officials. And on top of that, of course, she's in charge of major research programs. And I think it is part of that research she will, she will, she will ground her, her presentation in now. Um, over to you, Ruth. Thanks so much, um, Jens, and thanks for this opportunity. Thanks to the journal. I really want to appreciate the introduction and the symposium. Um, I'm not, I don't have a paper in the symposium, uh, but I think that the introduction in particular pulls together very useful questions. And what I'm gonna to try to do on the basis of some of our research is to provide at least some provisional responses from our slice uh, of research uh, and probably ans ask some more questions. Um, so just a, a, a bit of background, just to say that this forms part of a three country study that we've been undertaking with partner uh, universities and uh, civil society organizations in Ghana, Tanzania, and South Africa. And there's a particular logic for looking at these three countries with their diverse agrarian structures, uh, but also very distinct uh, regulatory and political responses to COVID. So it's quite a, an interesting comparative framing. But for today, I'm just going to focus primarily on, on the South African story. And of course, South Africa poses a, an example of how COVID affects uh, a, a substantially the agrarianized society, where the agrarian question of capital uh, is resolved, but um, facing a crisis of inequality and social reproduction. So uh, our focus has been not so much on the virus, uh, but the response to the virus, both the state's response and capital's response, and also how citizens' behavioral responses have been conditioned by existing markets and structures. So uh, the structure of the food system in South Africa, as many of you know, is a highly concentrated one right through from uh, input industries, large-scale agriculture, processing, and retail. Uh, so this food system uh, connecting urban and rural sites uh, is increasingly vertically integrated uh, and has the features of, um, has a dualistic feature or bifurcated in which most rural people, uh, even if partly involved in agriculture are net food buyers. 
Uh, our containment measures for, for COVID involved a hard lockdown with fluctuating alert levels, uh, school closures for a very long time, uh, and an initial prohibition on a lot of the informal food system, which meant that ostensibly scale neutral uh, COVID responses had very starkly distinct uh, outcomes. In fact, in initially all street trade was prohibited, uh, but later licensing requirements and various forms of, um, of officialdom were imposed on parts of the food system, while elsewhere, highly militarized and authoritarian response saw uh, the army and police deployed to supermarkets uh, to do crowd management uh, and business sectors worked with government uh, very closely to grow up lists of essential food and clothing that could be sold while all other commerce and retail was initially closed down. So, you know, in many senses, our study, which has been looking primarily at fresh produce and uh, small scale fisheries, uh, shows how COVID regulations shifted power and profit towards concentrated production, uh, processing, distribution, and retail sectors, um, and very much echoes uh, the, the, the opening sentiment of the patent in et al. introduction, which is that COVID-19 was a generated crisis within capitalism to which capital has adjusted very rapidly and effectively, and not a crisis of capitalism. So let me run through, essentially I thought that of the seven questions that you pose in your um, introduction, I might just respond to a few. One is around uh, what was disrupted uh, and what have been the antagonisms between larger and smaller capital. Um, now in South Africa, as I said, there's actually been a legislative difference between larger and smaller capital with uh, shopping malls, supermarkets and sites of, of larger capital being protected actively by the state, while small scale and uh, traders, including street traders, have had produce um, uh, confiscated. Uh, border closures equally uh, have seen air and sea cargo protected, while cross-border trade, typically by uh, smaller capital and, and individuals, has been locked down. So we see this contradiction of, in a sense, footloose capital, but um, but locked down labor um, uh, as both people and commodities were blocked across, um, across borders. Um, and one of the key ways in which uh, the differences in terms of access to markets has played out across these sectors has been um, the very uneven access to, um, to formal supply chains uh, and the ways in which particularly uh, the loss of restaurant trade uh, has hit the poor. All of this has been refracted through uh, the long range uh, changes, particularly the demise of marketing boards, uh, even the demise of local fresh produce markets, uh, which mean that, um, that small scale producers, petty commodity producers, uh, have faced the difficulties of engaging with multiple intermediaries to access markets. One of the big shifts we saw was in transport companies uh, shifting the rules around uh, taking produce on consignment uh, and demanding cash upfront for transport, uh, which has made uh, access to markets impossible for many smaller uh, producers. Um, and at the same time, the state has uh, responded primarily through uh, the provision of relief grants or in the form of vouchers for small scale producers, which has focused exclusively on the provision of vouchers for inputs from a restricted number of agribusiness companies, which has had the effect actually of, of concentrating uh, expenditure on inputs into fewer hands, largely agribusiness companies um, that procure most of their inputs uh, from overseas, sell only GM seed. And so there's been a massive shift as uh, the primary means of state support for uh, agrarian classes uh, of petty capital have redirected their input expenditure into these very restricted um, channels. One of the big uh, dynamics that we found across a couple of provinces is the significance of, uh, of in a sense, a double whammy between return migrants, young people returning from cities to rural areas, often because it was conceived that a lockdown would be short-lived. Um, and uh, so a loss of, on the one hand, remittance income, and on the other hand, extra, extra mouths to feed. 
And this was highly gendered, where younger women could be put to work in production in agrarian settings, whereas men uh, and, and, uh, and more children were seen as, um, as, a, as an enormous cost. So again and again, we saw, saw this story of return migration, uh, putting additional reproductive strain uh, onto already extended uh, and strained rural households. What are the key ways in which um, the state has attempted to manage uh, the crisis has been uh, through, uh, through cash grants? And uh, an important issue here is to look at how, on the one hand, the much fought for um, social relief of distress or COVID grant was almost entirely offset very quickly by price increases in supermarkets. So the, the first ever provision of social protection to able-bodied people between the ages of 19, uh, of 19 and 18 and 59, it's the first time that it's been recognized really that uh, adults um, who are able-bodied cannot meet their social reproductive needs through the market. This, uh, this first grant has been offset by price increases and quite astonishing rates of profiteering in the formal sector. So while we see a lot of the informal sector, street trade locked down, uh, food price inflation in supermarkets has been substantially outstripping general inflation. Uh, South African exports have been doing very well and some sectors uh, like citrus have seen very substantial increases. And while the economy as a whole shrank 7%, uh, the agricultural sector reported a 13% increase uh, in the first year of lockdown. Uh, so we have this contradictory uh, impacts um, in the, at the same time that we uh, found uh, the coronavirus rapid assessment survey found that 45% of households ran out of food uh, last April. Uh, several months later, when they uh, repeated that survey and despite the social protection measures, this was down to just 38% uh, of households running out of food. On the same day, uh, one of the big four uh, supermarkets in South Africa, ShopRite, declared its annual profits uh, of 8 billion rand, which was several orders of magnitude larger than the total state expenditure on food relief by that time. So one of the perverse uh, outcomes that we are exploring is the ways in which mitigation efforts actually cement and consolidate corporate power through parts of the food system. And this is particularly uh, the provision of social grants that are moving directly through supermarkets and shopping malls into sites of accumulation and reinforcing um, uh, agrarian capital. Um, and also forms of immediate food relief. Vouchers for food relief were available only at uh, formal markets. What we uh, have done also, as well as interviewing a lot of um, small-scale traders and others, is also to engage with agribusiness who report, uh, companies report uh, improved profits. As one person said, I did better because of COVID. Sales went up because government pumped money into agriculture. So uh, their markets are expanding. Very provisionally, and I know I must wrap up, I want to say that I think that there are very significant contrasts between the three countries that we're looking at. Uh, and the particularity of South Africa is one where the very concentrated um, forms of control throughout uh, the food system and throughout um, a commodity chains has meant that the poor lose out both as producers and as consumers. And this contrasts with some of the stories from Tanzania, where loss of, for instance, the tourist market or cross-border trade has actually lowered uh, prices into local, uh, into local um, uh, communities uh, and actually enabled new forms of, uh, of economic uh, connection within those rural areas. So I think that the de-agrarianized and de-industrialized and highly concentrated context in South Africa uh, really raises questions about whether um, uh, the, the, the COVID moment um, is one where the state has, has had to work uh, through the mechanisms that it already has and that there's a strong path dependency that we see. Um, so I will leave it at that and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. That was, that was really interesting. And, and, and the tantalizing hints here at the end 
of, 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 of differences is also interesting, even if even if that was not what the presentation was on. But on, on the main presentation, it'll be. It, I'm looking forward now to hearing uh, whether there are parallels between that and what we will hear from Argentina. Um, but and we will see now because now we will we will uh, I will ask uh, uh, Valeria Hernandez to 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 present. But, Valeria Hernandez is a professor in social and cultural anthropology at the Universidad Nacional de San Martín in Argentina, and she also holds a position as researcher at uh, uh, IRD in France. She has published widely on ag agribusiness, corporate hegemonies, technological innovations, such as biotechnology and climate vulnerability in Argentina, with a with an eye both to 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 the small farmers and 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 big business. So we will we will I'll hand over to you now, uh, uh, Valeria, and and we will we will get that that the story from that part of the world and 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 of course on on the specifics of of your research as well. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I I just recording the, the my presentation, so I will share with you my screen. Um, um, now you you can see my screen. Yes, it works well. Okay. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the Journal of Agrarian Change for this for this invitation. This presentation aims to develop a reflection on the way in which the context of the pandemic has affected the Argentinian agrarian configuration, whose central and antagonistic figures are the agribusiness actor and the family farmers and peasant movement. This presentation is based on an article written with my colleague Carla Gras published in this journal, from which we have extracted the main arguments. The plan of my presentation has three parts. First, I will show the Argentinian configuration when the pandemic started. Secondly, I will focus on the case of the offshore food production as a plausible strategy for agribusiness corporations, which generate new dilemmas for both alternative movements and policy action. Finally, I will reflect on the challenge facing the field of critical alternative movements. When the pandemic began, Argentina was already experiencing a long-term socioeconomic crisis. As you can see on the slide, all indicators were on red. GDP declined, while poverty, unemployment, and food insecurity increased significantly. 20% of households in the province of Buenos Aires, where two-thirds of the country's population lives, suffered from food insecurity. In this context, the government launched the Argentina Against Hunger program to mitigate the immediate effects of the pandemic situation. Many of the social assistance policies were implemented thanks to the collaboration of family farming organizations who were one of the social bases that supported the government to win the elections in 2019. In the pandemic context, these organizations were essential to bring good quality food to the most vulnerable population. With the unfolding socioeconomic crisis due to the pandemic, dollar generated by the agribusiness sector became crucial for the government because they have been used to pay for food assistance plans and, above all, to pay for the foreign debt. So right after the first economical restrictions, caused by the pandemic situation, the Argentina, the Argentina Agro-Industrial Council, CAA, was created. This agrobusiness coalition presented their strategy for the reactivation of inclusive, sustainable, and federal agro-industrial exports. 
This program proposed measures regarding market regulation, taxes, and financial support to promote exports. They also postulate an ag tech paradigm and the uh, technological agenda for the agro-industrial sector. This agenda drives the social and territorial embeddedness of market technology like blockchain, gene editing, digitalization of ecosystems, etc., by promoting them as essential and desirable. In this way, a few companies control what and how the Argentinian agricultural product sector produces. AgTech is an, is an offshoot of Gate Foundations Ag1, described by Shiva as state Shiva, the, old, the ultimate monoculture of, of a mine which has already devastated agriculture around the world through the extinction of species and the extinction of knowledge and culture. In August 2020, the government and the CAA launched the cooperation with China to produce 900,000 tons of pork in 25 large-scale farms in Argentina. Supporters of the initiative deploy arguments of economic development for pork producers who are mainly small-scale farmers and job creation. Opponents, on the other hand, underlined the profound environmental impacts that the pro Chinese mega farms would bring, increasing the production of cereals, corn, and soy in around 3 million tons and an exponential rise in water consumption. Greenhouse gas emissions would double from current levels. There are significant questions. Uh, about the distributive effects. In Argentina, agribusiness expansion has increased wealth concentration and inequality. Between 1988 and 2018, the total numbers of farms decreased by 41%. So the pork mega factor will increase concentration. The technological model is likely to exclude small scale farms, while the higher capital requirements will affect the price of pork for domestic concern. The projected Chinese investment in Argentina can be understood as an offshore food production strategy. Until 2019, China produced animal proteins, importing grains for feed. But after repeated health crises that led to the elimination of 50% of its swine stock, the Chinese government forested, for, fostered pork firms to develop strategies to control production in countries with high productive, productive potential. South America, and particularly Argentina, is a major target for China's food security policies. Argentina has been free of swine fever since 2018 and has considerable grain production and water availability. The Argentinian government and the agribusiness sector welcomed China's offshore food production strategy as a business opportunity to good develop local economy. The government for forces it as an occasion to boost the economy, the country's fragile social situation. For agribusiness, in addition to developing the new export market for pork, the production of cereals as food for mega farms would be increased. The way in which our business is using the crisis to accelerate business as usual puts the future of the political alliance of family farming organization in the spotlight. This alliance was crystallized in the electoral promise to promote a system of food sovereignty that supports sustainable agriculture through the transition to agroecology, 
where family farming is a central actor. The mega pig farms undermine this promise and create new dilemmas for family and peasant organization in relation to the government's support to check for changing the balance of power in Argentinian agriculture. The mega pork factories are an example of how agribusiness is reinventing its way forward as the government has announced similar agreements are also being analyzed for poultry and fish production an agro export based economy recovery seems to entail except accepting further ecological sacrifice and assuming health risk Well, to conclude, in a world where zoonotic diseases are expected to be part of the new normal, offshore food production and risks appear as a strategy both for agribusiness corporations to increase their profits and for powerful governments to ensure their population's food security. At the same time, the experience of the pandemic has raised awareness of the social and ecological trends of industrial agriculture, contestations from peasant organizations, environmental and feminist movement, political activists and other civil society groups demand that sustainability must be built from below. Our analysis shows, on the one hand, the urgent need to confront the ideological hegemony of market-driven technological solutions to environmental crises. On the other hand, it shows that established alliance between progressive government and the subaltern classes can be strongly challenged in a context of systemic crisis. Well, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, for, for talking 12 minutes, it's good to, to record the, the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Valeria. And you certainly got your points across there. Uh, it is, uh, yeah, in a sense, it, it'll be interesting to, to, to have a discussion between you and Ruth of, of, of certain of these trends. Uh, but maybe we can we can have that a bit later, um, because now we we will uh, go to India first, and uh, here we have a, here uh, Orlando Ruthman has agreed to present. Um, Orlando is a Delhi-based independent scholar and practitioner working in the areas of skill development, labor standards, and social movements. She holds a PhD from Oxford and has published for more than a decade, maybe two decades even, on informal labor, gender, and skills in India. Uh, and with no further ado, I will hand over to you, Orlando. Thank you very much. Um, that's very Thanks so much, Jonathan. Can everybody, I hope I'm clear. Yeah, yeah you're fine. Um, I'm gonna read from this, one second. Um, so uh, here we go. Um, it's a very, very different topic to the last two. I'm, I'm looking forward to how the discussion brings them together, yeah. Witnessing the disaster of India's 2020 lockdown and its aftermath for low wage migrant workers provides an occasion to pose some bigger questions about the regime of rights and entitlements in which these workers are situated. The lockdown laid bare how far rights which were granted could not be realized, how entitlements already in the system could not be extracted by workers when they needed them most. We consider the detail of what is actually required in terms of paperwork and procedure to realize what has already been granted and ask what are the effects for workers of pledging entitlements which are then so hard to avail and what objective is being served. The paper is based on voice notes posted on workers community media platform using simple phone technology not requiring internet access. The voice notes were contributed by migrant industrial workers between October and December 2020 
Workers contribute their experiences and opinions in order to share with other listeners and join a conversation. Often these are spontaneous, while sometimes they're also solicited from anchors and volunteer reporters. So if you'd like to learn more about the platform, please refer to the, the paper, the details are there. In this presentation, we're concerned with a, a, a proportion of India's 100 million strong internal migrants, particularly those who travel from labor surplus regions to work in factories in high growth industrial zones. These workers generally have clearly identifiable employers, some form of employment proof, and contribute a, a proportion of their wages to mandated social security schemes. This puts them on the periphery of the formal sector by the ILO's definition. During the brutally imposed lockdown from the end of March 2020, these workers learned that in spite of their foothold in the formal sector, they were to be forsaken by employer and state alike, unable to work and unable to travel, stranded far from home with no means to survive. As this condition was prolonged into April and May, the workers witnessed how little purchase came from their identity cards, regular monthly wages and social security subscriptions. When push came to shove, it seemed they were no better off than beggars. In normal times, entitlements requiring procedures and documentation often remain unutilized. It is the point of attempting to use them to actualize these entitlements that workers are drawn into a bureaucratic quagmire. And here's a few examples of what we mean by this entanglement. Firstly, workers are subject to multiple violations from their employers, and these were exacerbated during and after lockdown, including wage, theft of wages, illegal termination, non-payment of bonus, and forced overtime. The steps they can take to redress are complicated by many factors, among which are the presence of contractor intermediaries, false records designed to ensure that they cannot make claims to regular employment, and lack of documentation, which would stand up in court. A second example of an entanglement is to cope with lockdown, workers sought to draw down the mandated savings that they had deposited from their, wave, from their wages. It's known as the Provident Fund in India. But we learned that nearly half of these who tried to access their savings actually failed. The kind of issues they were facing were multiple. Various errors in the entry of basic details which didn't match, such as name, father's name, date of birth. Um, another problem is that they no longer used the phone number in which they, or they had to receive the, the one-time password to get access. Their date of leaving employment was never entered by their employer. Uh, they were never given a wage slip by the employer, um, which itself has recorded the savings account number on it. The employer has given a false account number to the worker, and we can only assume that has therefore pocketed the deductions made on the wage. So these are, is giving you a, a taste of the kind of problems which arise and stall and entangle them in trying to get the system to work. The third example, is the Mandatory Workers Insurance Scheme, known as the ESI. And this scheme announced a special unemployment cover during COVID. The offer was three months at the rate of 50% of your wages. But we learned that the vast majority of cardholders, which itself is a subgroup, because many people are not even cardholders when they should be, but even among those who have the insurance card, only a small proportion, about a quarter, turned out to be eligible and able to make good of this offer. The others were left entangled and struggling. Migrants on the formal periphery of the factory sector live with these disentitlements as a matter of routine. Most must swallow the theft of paltry wages periodically across their careers, and most must contribute to schemes that they can barely access. The workers say that at election time, Promises are made using the language of rights. But when a law comes to pass, they say, it just keeps workers busy with paperwork. Workers' rights then turn into paperwork at the point of access. Because there's no conducive environment of, enforcing, of enforcement, realization cannot happen unless through a matter of protracted bureaucratic procedure. 
the entitlements which the platform listeners know to be their due, whether related to payment of wages, provenant fund or annual bonus, become a matter of rules and procedures which obfuscate as soon as they are sought to be realized. Workers say that the paperwork associated with access to justice has been growing in recent years. And I quote one worker, there is a big change between today's law and the earlier law. Today, there are too many formalities which are hard to fulfill. Would a worker who keeps running for these things be able to keep his job, look after his family? And another worker, People say go to court, but that takes one or two years and 50 pairs of shoes are worn out in the process. No poor person should attempt it. Workers must engage in effort, which is not only time and money, but also interpretive to figure out the logic of the rule, procedure, technology, which comprise the factors and gatekeepers of an entitlement. To be on the periphery of formality then is to waive one's entitlement or else become entangled with procedures of eligibility, proof, and judicial process, a quagmire from which workers do well to extricate themselves if they are not to starve. This explains the workers' lack of interest in the recent changes of labor law, which were pushed through a locked down parliament. Workers make the obvious point that since the earlier law was never implemented anyway, why would the new laws make any difference? The law, one listener argued, is blind because it is alienated from the context of implementation. And in quotes, I can speak about some recent changes in the law, but it's meaningless since workers will not get the benefit, neither did they get the benefit yesterday. So these are blind laws. Many workers are of the view that while the law may look as though it's meant for them, it's actually a tool of the powerful. Where then does this disengagement lead? Now back at work after lockdown, workers are seen to be disentangling themselves further from entitlements and even from the, the wage labor system. They avoid provident fund registration and favor employers who will allow them to avoid it. They avoid time-based wages in favor of peace rates. They slip into self-employment away from wage employment. They limit their exposure to migrant jobs, which they now know will not deliver in their time of need. And they seek to build a worthy backup and alternative in the village, not just emergency welfare, but something which can actually provide a livelihood. In taking these steps, they may earn less, but they are hedging the risk of a repeat of the lockdown nightmare when their trappings of formality left them no better than beggars. There is a whole industry sector of NGOs, unions, lawyers, collectives, not to mention consultants and small shops, which are geared to tackle the bureaucracy of rights. These organizations are essential to overcoming the formidable barriers faced by workers on the formal periphery in actually realizing their entitlement. Those who lack such support will mostly lose out or self-exclude. These organizations are already closely involved in tracking the progress of the new government portal and various worker schemes which have emerged after lockdown to ensure accountability and delivery of the new government offering. Such organizations subsidize the cost to the worker of realizing these entitlements and perhaps help stem some of the disengagement which would otherwise arise. But it is uncertain whether we're any closer to a system which can function without this expensive army of white collar professionals to make it work. And I conclude. During and after lockdown, much of the debate around workers has been around the new labor legislation passed and pushing registrations of new schemes. In this presentation, instead, we've drawn on workers expressions to show the failure of already existing systems of registration and documentation. Systems in place with employers, parastatals and government officials could have been used to support migrants in lockdown and they were not. Sanctioned entitlements could work to edge towards decent work for migrants and are not. Instead, workers seek to claim what is theirs, find themselves, sorry, instead workers seeking to claim what is theirs, find themselves stymied by technical and procedural barriers 
and waylaid by responsibilities both fractured and unaccountable. What we know about the real cost of realizing entitlements calls for a new way to assess them. Can we not evaluate the costs in time, money and trouble in accessing them along with the benefits when they're realized? Underlying India's regime of workplace entitlements is a conflicting impulse. On the one hand, to issue schemes and benefits and on the other, to make them near impossible to realize. Is it just a question of poor design? in need of help from process and interface specialists? Or is there a deeper logic at play? In its continued issuing of schemes and entitlements, the state, of course, hopes to leverage political capital. But is there also a desire to ward off the risk of a population which is as disengaged as it is unentitled? The promise of the schemes is to reel them in, to a quagmire, perhaps, but to reel them in nonetheless. India's civil society is increasingly engaged in the work of actually realizing benefits from entitlements which are already granted. This is a very different type of work to organizing and to building associative power among workers. And as some workers have remarked, it is not the study of procedure and the pushing of paper that will give rise to labor leaders. Maurizio Adsini writes, the everyday need of extracting value from workers in a context of market competition is what continually fuels coordinated and collective action among workers. As India's migrants disentangle themselves from dependence on the industrial workplace after lockdown, we'll need to observe whether turning away from these entitlements is matched by greater coordination and collective action. A very uncertain conclusion, I'm afraid. <laughs> Um, look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Orlando. And, and yes, it might be a slightly different end of, of the discussion, but I think it is still quite connected because who is it that government policies around um, uh, COVID have sought to benefit? Who is it that care that they care less about? And I mean, the most recent figures in India that uh, came out on, on poverty, uh, uh, according to a state of working in India, to 2021 uh, uh, calculates that uh, the percentage of people below the poverty line in India increased by 20% in 2020. 20%, I mean, that is huge. Um, and, and these are, of course, the people that that, that you're talking about there, the, the migrant workers that have to return to the villages and so on. Um, now, uh, Thank you to all three for uh, uh, all four for the presentations, but but particularly for these uh, detailed insights to 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 different trajectories here. And I I I thought they they were so interesting in, because they point to both similarities and and and, and differences. Um, one one point that struck me was uh, Ruth Hall's. Uh, idea of, of past dependency. It's not a term I particularly like, but the idea that existing structures and ex existing power relations um, matters for what happens. I, I think that's, that, that is certainly one way of, of looking at, at what's going on here. And, and we have uh, in the, in the uh, chat already the first uh, uh, questions and comments, which is of course what we move on to now, the, the Q&A session, but maybe one way to, to, to start that up is, is to, to slightly link to the two uh, comments and questions there uh, to, uh, to, to, to just have a round on which, uh, what, to what extent uh, have governments in these three different countries uh, uh, been um, in any way been uh, um, pushed by uh, either workers or small peasants to uh, mitigate their policies? Or to what extent is it simply a big business, agribusiness, agri or, or as it is in, in the Indian context from what we heard, certainly not laborers, that is, that is uh, uh, anything that they care about. So maybe that's a way to, to start up. A few comments on, 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 on government policies and to what extent they have been influenced, shall we say, from below. Um, Ruth, would you like to, to, to start, just take a round on this? 
Yeah. Um, so thank you. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and I think what's interesting here is that um, the, the formal labor movement in South Africa has been utterly unable to mount any kind of coherent response. Uh, and rather what we see is new formations and new alliances transcending some rural and urban areas as people demand access to land for housing. And a lot of the sharp edge of this mobilization is actually peri-urban around the big cities um, with uh, demands for access to land and housing and spaces to trade. Uh, and I think that uh, with local government elections coming in just a few weeks, it's striking that uh, the political parties are putting urban agriculture, access to land and markets firmly on the agenda in Cape Town for the first time, two of the political parties are offering um, the dismantling of golf courses on public land in favor of urban agriculture and, and low income housing. So. Although I, one shouldn't exaggerate um, effects, uh, I think that the, the push and the reframing of demands as not just demands for jobs and not just demands for social grants, but demands for access to productive resources, I think is very significant. At the same time, um, uh, I think that, uh, you know, the very first clear victory of, um, of, uh, of mobilization around food uh, and uh, under COVID was actually about contesting the closure of the National School Nutrition Program, the school feeding program, which feeds just under 10 million children daily. And in South Africa, with a population of 60 million, that's that's a good proportion um, of uh, of the population. And uh, and that was a, a very significant. Uh, movement uh, supported by by rural and urban movements. I think that the the particular moment uh, that I think has shifted the politics in South Africa and potentially um, provides both the kind of crisis on which new structures can be built is the recent wave in July of mass looting. Uh, and public unrest, burning of shopping malls and shops that happened in both uh, around Johannesburg and in parts of KwaZulu-Natal after uh, the imprisonment of former president um, uh, Jacob Zuma. I mean, there you had uh, an astonishing attack on sites of, of capital. Uh, 161 malls were intensively damaged. And uh, one of the responses in parts of uh, both Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal is uh, street traders and farmers arguing that one of the jobs of local government is to not provide planning a permission for the rebuilding of malls that are seen as extracting capital out of low income areas. Um, so I, I think that there's something happening around sort of the bringing together of rural and urban voices around local production and local uh, value chains, uh, but it is inchoate uh, at present. But I, I see that the sort of articulation beyond an entitlement to social grants and towards um, opportunities for production is there, but I think it tends to be exaggerated by some of the agrarian movements who would love to see it come into being. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, I now let me move to Valeria, but I should also say that uh, the, the, we discussed this be, before the the the, uh, the roundtable that the Valeria's co-author Carla Grass might also uh, jump in to co co-answer questions on, on on the paper and beyond. So uh, now over to Valeria Carla um, for for a, a, a comment to to my to my question. Thanks, Chen. I, I will take over this uh, this question that you have. Uh, post. In the case of Argentina, um, of course, the, the, there was um, uh, an influence from uh, below, and I should say, uh, we uh, Valeria um, mentioned that when uh, she talked to us about the um, support that um, small farmer or peasant movements. Uh, organizations have uh, had uh, offered to the newly elected government. And uh, one thing that I, I should explain is that uh, there were no uh, demands uh, from below from organized uh, workers organizations, which are not very uh, 
strong in, in Argentina, late, uh, rural workers. Um, and the, but that, uh, that influence uh, was, um, or came from um, the, how do you say, between and uh, I, do, I don't say if we can call it an alliance, but a proximity between urban popular organizations, that is people that do not have formal uh, employment and that who mainly um, that are very um, in the margins of the mar market labor and that they survive on uh, working uh, in uh, social assistance programs, that these are trans uh, uh, income transfer programs that demand from the people who receive them uh, contraprestación, um, to, uh, that demand that they work in, for example, um, in uh, popular diners, uh, all kind of uh, community level work. And so but these organizations are increasingly strong in Argentina and they have, um, and, and they have established uh, a dialogue with peasant organizations and have integrated them as part of that popular economy uh, sector. And it was, uh, from this uh, alliance that when the new, newly elected government in 2019 came to, came to government, uh, a program named uh, Argentina Against Hunger was launched and specifically this program gave these um, small uh, peasant organizations, landless workers, they uh, gave, gave them an, a significant role by including them as providers to, of uh, food to um, uh, diners, popular uh, diners, and also to be included in the, um, when the state um, buys food for, uh, for many of these social programs. Uh, but the thing is that they are not, they are seen, they are seen as part of this, um, as I have said, um, marginal sector. And when it comes to the agricultural, agrarian, agricultural uh, sector, the government mainly sees agribusiness and uh, market farmers. And the other thing is that both the possibility of maintaining these uh, social, trans, uh, social uh, programs in a population where, in a country where 40% of the population is under the poverty line, the, is, um, is squeezed on the one hand by the need of um, having the economic resources to do so, which mainly comes from the external sector, which is basically dominated by agribusiness. We should have in bear in mind in that sense that nearly 26% of total value export in Argentina come from the two complexes, soybeans and maize complex. And the other thing is that those uh, external resources are also needed to pay back the external debt. So it's a kind, it, it, we have there a kind of um, uh, lock, lock in for, for many uh, measures. And um, so, yes, there is a lot of uh, mobilization from below, but I believe that we have to understand that how far can that influence get? It's also an arena of uh, strong dispute, but uh, we have to understand also all these 
other particularities and the 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 fact that um, maybe it, it's a paradox but the recognition of these these peasant sectors that 20 years ago we didn't speak of peasants in Argentina we spoke about small scale farmers but we didn't we didn't identify the social and economic power imbalances and structural constraints they had. We, we found peasants finally, but that recognition goes hand in hand with seeing them as part of this marginal sector with which the government doesn't know how to include them because we have an economy that has not that has had decreasing um, economic indicators for the past decade so the capacity of the Argent of the country's economy to generate uh, employment is really really very very feeble hope you Hope I answered your question. Oh, you did, and it's it it, it was there, yeah. and there are many layers to it, and, and that is interesting. I, I I like the formulation that that you have found the peasants, um, and and that maybe they 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 don't look as the world conquering class that that some people would think they would be. Um, that wasn't quite what you said, but that is that is how I understood it. Um, but. Um, but let us let us let us finish this round with going to Olanda and then uh, take some more questions after that. O Olanda, you you mute Olanda. Just very briefly, um, I mean I, I'm sure many of you have been following the farmers' protest in India, which um, is enormously significant because they've held out for so long um, um they're uh, they're really you know they're outshining any other signs of of opposition that we have to the current regime um and they're still at it and they're not giving up and their protest is in the short term related to three changes that the government tries to push through in terms of the law controlling agricultural markets but uh, it's very much uh, a resistance to um, the global uh, corporate, you know, the corporatization of, of agriculture, which is on the cards. And in, in comparison, uh, Labour's protest has been very diminutive. Um, and, uh, you know, it seems that that you know we're not we're not seeing um strong and we're not seeing any signs of, of growing organization strength with respect to the union route at all covid has not brought that on uh, so the question is then okay what else is going on outside of unions um so that's a very short response but jens i'm sure you you'd be able to answer your own question probably better than me so <laughs> <laughs> what not? No, <laughs> it's uh, and I don't think that is what what would be so interesting. What's interesting is to is to listen to you who, who sit and are in the middle of these uh, analysis and and discussions. But uh, but thanks um, and and uh, yeah no, and it is an interesting point, isn't it? That labor while while it might lose out because of this, it, that is not the, the an, an organized voice. It is. Uh, the, the voice comes from different corners, but it's but and it's and it's not a, a clear from one place that it comes. It comes from different sorts of groups in different countries. So yeah, but but uh, let us let us um, uh, move on to, to 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 questions from the floor. I have seen no hands up yet. Uh, I have seen a, a number of questions. In the chat, and maybe that is where we where we turn now. Uh, and these questions maybe also relate to 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 the issue of of, of the peasantry uh, and 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 protest from that in a way. But uh, uh, Enrique, I think you have, you have monitored the, the question. So would you would you um, uh, give us a summary of of the questions? And if you've got any questions yourself as well. 
Sure, Jens. Uh, thank you, and, and thanks to all the speakers. I think it, it's been very, very interesting as an analysis. So in the chat, we have a couple of questions, really. The first one comes from Nigel, and I suppose this is more for uh, sort of Valeria Carla. Um, he asked if she, we should be worried about the potentially more deadly zoonotic diseases that could arise from industrial animal farming, the sort of large scale uh, kind of farming that you were speaking about is taking place in, in Argentina, connected with trade with China. And a related question, I suppose this one could be to all the speakers, how we can get governments to do something in terms of regulating agribusiness expansion and what would be the, the role of consumers in that? So that's Nigel. Um, then we also have from Gerson, he's um, sort of, arguing that we, given that we know that agribusiness is very destructive and all the, the negative impacts that it has, he says that in Brazil, um, there seems to be some agency from peasant movement um, growing there. So he asked whether we could have something at a global scale, so like a peasant sort of response to, to this uh, problem of agribusiness expansion, so perhaps something that could be, and it continues to be a, a, a very contentious issue in the grand studies, as we know, so it's a pertinent question that perhaps we can explore it in the context of COVID now. Uh, and I have my own question, if that's okay, it's, it's very short. This is uh, also for uh, Carla and, and Valeria. So it, it's about the agribusiness structure in, in Argentina. And in my own research in, in Bolivia, I, I tend to, understand, I want to understand the, the green structure there, and it strikes me that that is not as homogeneous as it's usually presented in other places like Argentina or Brazil, but it might be that it's actually the case that is highly concentrated and there is no room for, let's say, better off small farmers to take part in that. In Bolivia, better off small farmers, you can call them peasants or campesinos, um, they do engage, they are incorporated into agribusiness change. So my question to you is, is that something that also happens in Argentina with this new deal of exporting meat to China? You see the chance that the better off, of course, not all of them, but the better off small scale, small scale farmers would be able to participate in, in this sort of project, state project, or this is really simply about a large scale agribusiness alone. So that's my question, thank you. Thanks. And before before I hand over to to the panel, uh, just just two things. Firstly, uh, you might uh, hear uh, drumming outside. It is uh, the SOAS student uh, activist <laughs> group that I think are training for for, for the next uh, for their next outing. So so that, that is a bit of a background here, very appropriate, uh, but maybe a bit of a nuisance to listen to. Um, but. Uh, <clears throat> Before handing back back to the panel, um, uh, Shreya, are there any questions uh, uh, on 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 YouTube or any other questions from the, from the chat that you want to highlight? So any questions of yourself? Yeah, there's there's nothing on the YouTube chat, but I think there is one question. Uh, I, I suppose for Ruth, uh, drawing on Orlando's presentation, which is can can South African workers learn from the Indian workers? Uh, I mean, because we heard that after the lockdown, the Indian workers looked for alternative solutions. Um, so that's one question. And I, I actually had a, a small question of my own, which is that um, perhaps related to this one, I think there was, there was some talk around sort of hedging of risks by kind of smaller farmers and, and by workers. Uh, and I wonder what, and you know, kind of going back to the village and that sort of stuff. And I wonder in, in all these different contexts, what do you, I mean, do you think that it means anything for the politics of land in, in these different contexts? How, I mean, do you think it would manifest in any particular way for, you know, discourses around land struggles or significance of land, um, either in the short term or sort of the medium term? Uh, yeah. I think that's all, Jens. Thanks. And thanks. Uh, uh, a fair few big issues here. Uh, uh, Bruce, will you start again um, to choose uh, any of those questions that you that you wish to comment uh, or, or, or contribute to? They're big and meaty, but I'll do my best. I wanted to weigh in on Nigel's question about zoonotic diseases and the need for consumer education or restrictions on agribusiness. I mean, I think that uh, there's a lot of that discourse, which actually is about trying to place conditionalities on 
uh, and obstacles uh, for, uh, for access into formal markets. Um, and the overriding discourse of getting integrating small scale farmers into commercial value chains is the is the primary solution, despite the fact the evidence uh, that they lose out in formal value chains compared to a, in local markets. I, I can see some um, <laughs> some some real risks in in what Nigel is proposing. Uh, in terms of alternative solutions, Matthew, I think that you're you're right. Uh, the Indian experience with uh, entitlements becoming paper entanglements is precisely the story that we see in South Africa. I recognize so much of what Orlando was saying, which is about forms of relief, conditionality, proving certain entitlements, a vast amount of state attention uh, on weeding out anyone who might not comply or have the right kind of documentation, and an overwhelming push towards formalization of of business registration and enterprise uh, as, as a way of, um, of controlling, partly controlling movement, partly controlling the movement of goods and people. Um, so I, a lot of that is familiar. The alternatives uh, around which uh, I think that a lot of the energy of political mobilization is taking place is on the demand for social grants and particularly for universal basic income. That is the thing, which is uh, sort of the epicenter around which a lot of other struggles are circling. Um, the great worry of that, of course, is that um, social protection and cash transfers from the state in the absence of wider restructuring um, is, we've already seen, uh, reinforcing patterns of capital accumulation. Uh, but I think that one of the, the striking things is, uh, is the sort of the newly unemployed. Um, so with chronic levels of structural unemployment, we have in the, in the bottom quarter of income earners who were formerly waged, there's been a 31% loss of jobs within the first year of COVID. So, as a, so it's the differentiation of, of, of the rate of unemployment, I think, uh, creates a new kind of possibility and particularly is bringing urban kinds of politics into rural areas. So yes, I think Shreya, um, uh, it's very hard to say, partly because a lot of uh, the people who seek uh, opportunities in the informal sector or through petty commodity production or trade uh, are shifting around, um, but definitely a new kind of demographic connection. Um, so, I mean, I do think that uh, in terms of urban and rural politics, uh, a kind of politics that centers around entitlements from the state is very live. Uh, and the kinds of entanglements in which that uh, those entitlements have been caught is very much um, the target of, of outrage and, and opposition. And I think that one of the interesting kinds of innovations that we're seeing in low income areas is actually uh, attempts by community activists and social movements to forge direct direct links between small scale uh, petty commodity producers around the urban fringe uh, and low income communities bypassing um, corporate value chains entirely. So I think that the ideas around food sovereignty, uh, localization of food systems is very live, um, but in an incredibly hostile context. Thanks. I, I, by last muted, I said very good, but of course I meant this is not very good. This is this is this is this is a very negative story, but it's very interesting to hear that story, and 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 the the, the so how how difficult it is to 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 organize anything going counter to what's going on. Um, uh, um, Valeria and uh, and Carla. Yeah. Well. Um... One of the questions was, and I'm, I'm going to connect the, uh, the one that was uh, asking about the zoonotic diseases rising from industrial animal farming and how, can, and how do we get, or how are, or how we see governments are, are, are responding to it, to this. And uh, of course, as Ruth was saying, this, um, uh, the, the, this uh, potential uh, this, uh, sonotic diseases are part of 
uh, what uh, counter movements and opposers to this uh, to these schemes are um, advocate. Uh, and in the case of Argentina, this uh, with this was the first reaction that linked uh, not only uh, um, people from farmers, small the, the smaller farmers, um, but also um, urban uh, consumers, uh, envi environmental organizations, and so on, and. Um, that um, that response kind kindly of stop the 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 launching this initiative. Uh, but the, the the interesting point to to make here is how did the government uh, move because this uh, um, this uh, arrangement um, with uh, China was not only about this. It, this was a part of a uh, larger program uh, of, of, of economic cooperation. And so uh, how were this um, resistance and this questioning uh, uh, left aside? Well, the government decided, the national government decided not to go on pushing the, the this the mega pork uh, project, but instead allowed that negotiations began between uh, local governments that would be the provinces. We have the nation provinces, and then the what we call the municipalities. So, uh, prov provincial governments started while all this uh, uh, up. Uh, um, contested were, were going on, the uh, provincial governments uh, went along uh, signing contracts with Chinese partners. And so, for example, in the pro in a northern province that that is the, the province of, of Chaco, that's part of the uh, um, Argentine Chaco region, there were, uh, there are, um, contracts with two large uh, Chinese farmers to establish this, uh, these pork farms. Of course, as a way also to, um, uh, to satisfy demands from smaller farmers organizations, the initial project of large scale uh, farms was uh, transform or was proposed to, to be transformed in order to make them smaller so that smaller farmers could participate. But um, this is not clear if this is going to work because of course negotiations are not open, are not pub publicly known. Uh, and as regards the, the other question that uh, Enrique was uh, mentioned about agribusiness structure in Argentina. Of course, in all our uh, researches, we have um, argued and showed that as regards the, uh, the farming sector, <clears throat> it is not, it is a, it is not a very, it's, it is not an only large scale. There are medium and small scale farmers, not we we don't find much of the what would like what we could call the uh, family based uh, the units that are mainly based on family on the the work of the family members um, because of the and and not so small units because uh, it's not very um, economic to um, to have soybeans, for example, in 10 hectares. So, uh, but of course, and that is what we have also underlined that has uh, given uh, agribusiness um, legitimacy, because we can see in many parts of Argentina that in fact, it, the 
the recover in fact the movement created uh, by agri by soybean production uh, meant in many uh, uh, towns in the in the country uh, a kind of a, an economic recovery very limited and equal but money was moving so that is one thing that many colleagues do not um, are, are not uh, argue that they that this is a polarized and that the green desert that there are no farmers and we, and that's not what, what we have seen in our uh, in 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 our research and again i think that this is that that's a significant part of the social acceptance that uh, the, the the agribusiness model also has but um what we uh, but we also uh, uh, point in our work that it's not the thing it's not only to see if there are many how many farmers and which are there's and which kind of farmers they are but uh Technological innovations are, con are basically controlled and concentrated in very few hands with very little uh, participation of national firms. And that's a point that it is, that is sig extremely significant to understand how, uh, what trajectories of change and how uh, squeezes are organized. Because in fact, many of the smaller farms that have been expelled that have been excluded from production in the last three decades have to do because they couldn't keep up with the uh, rhythm of innovate technological innovation that that has been demanded and i think uh, and some of the uh, what um shira was asking about politics of land um Things are not only one way, and so in in the case of Argentina, there has been um, that there, there is a poly, uh, there are poly, public policies of uh, land re uh, regulation for small uh, in very small units, and which mainly involve involve uh, the, the the smallest farmers. Um, but the thing is that you don't only have to access to the to the control of land, but you also need to have the resources to produce, and that that's another um, that's another talk. <laughs> Thanks, Carla, and, and very interesting to to get an understanding of so, so how this model can 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 gain public support. How it is possible for 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 the, the, the growth of agribusiness to also have some public support because of the economic uh, growth that that it leads to, and it sounds to me as different to the situation what Ruth describes in 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 South Africa. But that might be interesting to to hear more from from her about. And there, of course, on in the chat, we can also see more nuances there about how even though big business in South Africa benefits from this agribusiness, there are also constraints uh, uh, relating to this. So, so the, the picture becomes so much, much more, so, so um, much more pixelated, much, much, uh, there are many more details than as we go into it. Orlando, over to you. Um. So it, I actually my my line cut a little bit during the question. So I'm I, I, my in my understanding, I'll try to respond to the one about the uh, the politics of land, but also the um, the lessons or learning from some of the Indian workers' responses. Is that about right? Yeah. Yes. Can, uh, you do okay. That? Uh, Jenny, I've seen your hands uh, uh, afterwards. So. Um, just get Orlando's uh, uh, comments first, and then yeah. So um, I think Shreya's question is fascinating, and I I have no idea. <laughs> I just feel like I'm just making a few guesses. Um, 
So I don't know enough about, um, I mean, I used to work in rural areas, but it's been so long. <laughs> I just feel a bit underqualified, but um, clearly the configuration will change, right? Because what, what's happening now, um, first of all, we know that um, the youth, along with women, the youth were very badly hit by COVID. So that is something that all, all also came through the State of India Working Report. We've got uh, much higher levels of youth unemployment than we had already, and it was already very high, right? So, so what does that mean? And, and we know that um, uh, more and more of those young people will remain in the countryside on account of the um, sort of collapse of so many of the wage jobs, yeah? Um, so that will play a part in it, in the politics of what could emerge. Um, then we've got all these um, seasoned migrants who, who are heading back. Um, and so you've got a, a repopulation of folks who have been based in industrial zones, uh, who have been fighting their way with difficult employers, who have been collectivizing, usually informally, without any links to unions. Um, so they're, they're, all of those folks um, spending more time in the countryside, you have to think through what implications that will have on the politics of land or the politics of anything, really. Uh, and then the other thing which might be significant is, of course, there's also evidence that um, that uh, capital investment is transferring. So that capital which was leading uh, in industrial zones is to some extent moving into the countryside towards the workers. Because there's, I mean, this is all anecdotal evidence from the, some of the industrial regions where I've had contact. And, um, you know, there are labor shortages in zones which never faced it before. And one of those zones is the, the capital region where, where I'm sitting. It, it's always been a labor surplus zone, which has created a, the character of the place, while other parts of India have had labor shortages for some time, like Tamil Nadu, for instance. All of that's changing. So we've got shortage here, and we've got even more severe shortages um, in, in, in some of the southern states, uh, which faced uh, lesser shortages earlier. Um, and in fact, we had a complete mess during the, the height of the lockdown when many of the state governments actually started, the, the central government, when it realized that all the migrants were starving, they said, OK, let's put on special trains and help them to get home. You know, They did it late, but they did do it. And then the state government stepped in and said, no, no, these can't go home because we have to run the factories. So it created these this absurd situation um, and, you know, a lot of people... Uh, were horribly hit by it, but um, so so basically we've got um, these different uh, changes going on, and and on the whole, uh, you could say that the population of certain states, which were traditionally labour, um, um, which, which which are rich in natural resources and which were exporting labour, um, are no longer going to be doing that to the same extent. They will receive capital investment, and they will export far fewer workers than they were before. So what that means for politics, I just don't know, but it would be, it would be very interesting to follow. Um, in terms of the other question about um, Indian workers becoming less dependent, um, I, I'm, I'm really excited by this, and maybe I'm just being romantic and deluded, but um, I keep on remembering this chapter by um, James Scott, you know, about the the three, two cheers for anarchism and the strength of the peasants. And uh, on our doorstep around the border of Delhi, we see these farmers who are just not giving up. Why are they not giving up? Because they have land and they're, they're producers in and, of, in and of themselves. Yeah. Um, and they have the wherewithal just to, to hold out. They have holding out power, which... Um, we know that most workers, uh, in industrial workers earning minimum wages, they, they just don't have that holding out power. They certainly don't have it um, when they're living in the industrial area where they work, right? So if a lot of those folks go home and, and they can make good of, of having a, this, an expression which I heard from one of the workers, a, a, a more solid backup, yeah, 
rather than you know in the in the before covid the the home was the last resort the village was very valuable because you really had to go if if you if you couldn't have work in the in the city in the industrial area you had to go home there was no option that there was nobody that that really stayed long in the city without a daily wage right and that's why lockdown was so crazy because they were forced to stay in the city without a daily wage and the whole structure is built so that as soon as your daily wage goes you don't stay more than a few days and and you head back to the village but when you get to the village you don't have much but you can survive right but now what's happening is that you've got all these um uh, workers who are trading off they're saying well you know we're we're, we're not going to take that risk again um so we're going to look at the village in a new way you know and seriously we're going to uh, figure out what we can do here we're going to um figure out how we can invest um, and you've also got, as I said before, you've got this bigger capital also coming in, right? So, um, um, but I'm, as I said, I'm not, I'm not working on, on on rural areas at all. But 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 what what I'm hoping is that this um, strengthened um, foothold, or even uh, how do you say it? It's basically creating a better bargaining position by investing in the backup in the village. That should. Um, perhaps help to raise uh, the workers' bargaining power with respect to the wage jobs in the city. So, and, and already we we learned that they've sort of created a, a scarcity by by going back home. We've got a new scarcity which was not there before in, in the capital. Um, so that's a few ideas. Yeah. Thanks a lot. No, and it is certainly very interesting. It obviously also have very clear gendered aspects because the the women that used to stay back home in the village are now losing their jobs. The the, the, the evidence in India is clearly that that women lose jobs, men yeah. get jobs, or, or yeah. men survive and get other jobs, and it's probably the jobs that the women used to have that they get now. So 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 there are some very intriguing aspects of, uh, of this which which isn't the time to get into, but maybe just to, to, to flag up. Now, we haven't got an awful lot of time left. Uh, we have, uh, Jenny would, would like to ask a question, so we will let uh, uh, Jenny have you. the last question and then oh my God. Around for anyone that would like to answer the question or any other comments here. Right. I do apologize for the unorthodox way, but I got told yesterday to renew or upgrade my Zoom, and I did, and I cannot find anywhere to ask questions or anything till I've learned it, and I can't, so I'm sorry. But I was very struck by what Shreya, is it Shreya said about land, because all this time, I'm just about to finish a book on land, which has taken me years, uh, because I was very struck that when anybody analyzes anything capitalist or Marxist or whatever. I mean, Chomsky wrote a 400 page book on understanding power and he didn't mention land once. Now, if we haven't got any land to stand on, we are completely powerless. I mean, in town, if I sit down, a policeman can come and move me. If I don't own land and I sit on it, I can be... Land is absolutely crucial to power. And yet it seemed to me in all the time you were talking here that land got very, very little discussed. And yet it's the most powerful factor you can think of. And when, when you mentioned it, I suddenly thought, look, I, I would like to draw attention to the fact that lots of things you said can be changed just by thinking about analyzing land ownership and what that means and who really the power has. Because all of us pay for a square meter to live on. We've not got, there is uh, one or two little caves of what they call terra nullius, which doesn't belong to anybody in some of the Philippine islands and around there. Uh, and you can't buy that land because it hasn't got a boundary and you can't sell it. And what first thing capitalism did was put boundaries around land. And then they could say, this is the value of it and they could sell it. Now land is being crucial. And once you start looking, you can see how nearly everything one of you has said depends on who the land owns and what it happens. Now, that's all I want to say, just to draw attention to the fact that it's so powerful. And that, as I say, if, if uh, what's his name, can write a 400 pound book, uh, page book on understanding power and he doesn't mention land, how is that possible? How is it possible? But I feel really passionate about it because 
I, I've worked with landless people in Brazil. I know what happens, you know. I, I, I worked with homeless people in Brighton. I mean, it's all the same thing. If you've got nowhere, that piece of land that belongs to you, you've paid for, you, you can't live anywhere. That's how serious it is. And it influences lots of movements uh, in, in South America, where I know more about India, I know very little about, except that I read in books, you know, it's, it's everywhere. So that's all. Sorry, I'll shut up now. I know there's not much time. Thanks, 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 Jenny. And it and it maybe takes us back to some of the issues that Jonathan raised in in the beginning of what the uh, what he when he talked about different classes of labor, the landless, the the what the, the peasantry or the or the farmers and and, and big big capital. Um, but um, would. With any last comments or answers to to this comment uh, from Ruth, uh, uh, Valeria, Carla, and uh, Anna Landon, and she would do the round. Or, uh, Ruth. Uh, well, firstly, yes, nothing to disagree with uh, that land is foundational, but for what? Uh, for production or for reproduction? Uh, and uh, you know, in what struck me very similar to to the story you told, um, Orlando is in a context where we've now hit 64% uh, youth unemployment um, and where even in rural areas, even among those households who are involved with agriculture, the vast majority are buying most, if not all of their food. Um, that, that this sort of binary of urban land struggles around access to housing and rural land struggles around access to, to land for production, that, that, that's broken down entirely. Um, and, and entitlements and, and access to resources for survival, for social reproduction, I think is at the center. And that's really the kind of discourse that potentially uh, creates the basis for connecting uh, struggles across these sites. Um, uh, and I think that the, uh, while the struggles may be for social reproduction, the danger of course is that that gets contracted into cash transfers without a structural change within uh, agrarian power and agrarian capital. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Carla, Valeria, Valeria. No, I, I, uh, I also uh, agree with uh, Jenny's, uh, what, with what Jenny was saying. And I, no, my intervention would be in the same line as, as, as Ruth's. It's the question is not only, uh, I believe that the question is has to do with uh, land for what and in and in how many other ways can the people that have the land, their uh, social uh, reproduction and the way they produce can be controlled by other actors who don't need to own the land to do that. So I think that um, uh, the, the, the question is who owns the land and how how those people can uh, effectively be autonomous to decide what they do with that land and how they uh, also appropriate from the from the product of their work in, in the land. And the other thing is that I mean these ecological uh, changes and climate disasters and and so and so on we also need to to consider that many there are many uh, communities that or many peasants that they may be gaining the titles of their land as for example happens in a lot of places in argentina but uh the they 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 are the way that other big farmers are um um, are near them, they have enclosed, in fact, the access to water, uh, the land that they receive is absolutely deployed. And so their land can be also the, 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 the thread through which to analyze more complex uh, relationships, I, I think. But thanks for reminding us. Indeed, and thanks, Carla. Um, uh, Olanda? 
I don't think I have much, much to add, um, only that uh, it'll be very interesting to see what, what is the impact of, uh, from COVID on how things will change. And, you know, a state like Bihar is already very populated and uh, much of it is, is peri-urban and it, it already had um, some um, tapering off of, of migration. It's been a huge contributor of migration for, for many years in India. And, and now it, it's just taken a boost further in that direction. And in places like that, where the land competition is already quite tight, it'd be interesting to see um, what happens next. But yeah, I don't really have anything more to add. Sorry. So thank you, everyone. I think this is now the time where we draw to draw this to a close. And uh, I would, uh, I thought it was, it, uh, Hugely interesting. I, I learned a lot from, from this, and uh, I will not try to 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 summarize it. I will, and I, but if I but if I were to to say anything at the end, it would be along the lines of of Orlando. This is a process, and we 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 will have to see where this takes us. It is it's it has strengthened certain processes, certain certain classes, and it has weakened others, but we don't know where the where the conditions and, and capital will 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 take us in this. We shall see. Um, so thanks to Ruth, to Orlando, to uh, Valeria, to Carla, to Jonathan for for, for, for his introduction, to Sreya, to uh, Enrique for, for for being part of organizing this, and to everyone everyone else for for attending and uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, we have another uh, seminar webinar in two weeks' time, where Kirsten Abendini from El Colegio de Mexico will talk on land markets in rural Mexico in the 21st century, the effects of 1992 counter reforms on common property, so land and land markets. Um, uh, thanks to everyone, and uh, hopefully see some of you um, in two weeks' time. Thanks. Bye. Mm -hmm.